we are today we are trying to see how philosophy has to be integrated uh, in our day to day life uh, every moment if you don't deeply think about what we are and how we are linking ourselves to you know it's a kind of reclamation of our genius uh, uh, to for association and interlink i would say so in this context this is a very very significant lecture in the series <clears throat> i would uh, like to briefly introduce sundar and uh, professor krishnamar it's very important that we have professor krishnamar with us today because uh, we always ask our speakers to suggest their own chairs because uh, we think the space that we have here is not just a very formal kind of space where you know two people come and sit there and just moderate or you know just say a few things and go back but there is a kind of deep engagement with the topic um, you know both of them have which we think brings some kind of value to the whole exercise that they're trying to do here so um, uh, we are very happy that both of them are here and sundar is the director of uh, the manipal center for philosophy and humanities uh, at manipal university he is author of the following books uh, the translating the world science and language which came out in 2002 philosophy of symmetry 2004 indian philosophy and philosophy of science what is science the cracked mirror which is the new book which is like you know doing very well uh, and indian debate on uh, experience and theory co-authored with gopal guru i'm happy that gopal is also here uh, he is uh, an editorial advisory board member of leonardo book series published by mit press and the series editor for sciences science and society in rutledge professor krishna kumar is professor of education at the university of delhi and uh, is noted for his writings in sociology and history of education he has used the school curriculum as a means of social inquiry he has framed his study of education in a critical engagement with modernity in a colonized society his writings explore the patterns of conflict and interaction between forces of the vernacular and the state as a teacher and a bilingual writer he has developed an aesthetic pedagogy <coughs> and knowledge that aspires to mitigate aggression and violence which i think is very very uh, significant in addition to his academic work he writes essays and short stories in hindi and also has written for children from 2004 to 2010 he was director of the national council for educational research and training and a pex organization for curricular reforms in <laughs> india i welcome both of you and professor kishon Krishna Kumar is with, sitting next to me. It's also slightly intimidating. Uh, he is one from whom, for those of us who have not been in the school of education, I mean professionally, but have been interested in the question of education, uh, he is somebody from whom uh, we consider as a teacher, even though he may not have been a teacher because we have learned a lot from his uh, writings and so on. Um, it is intimidating, but then it also makes me make me work a little bit harder. in preparing this talk and it also gives me the confidence that if i make any mistakes about education it's good to have a chair with him because he can tell you the real story about it um you know in the context of this uh, leela series i thought the question of thinking and learning uh, which has become a focus of many educational interventions in recent times was something which is worthwhile thinking about in our context today and uh, i think part of the thing which uh, part of the reason why this arose was when i was talking to vizio about this um, you know she was talking to us about the new program we started at uh, the manipal center of philosophy and humanities it's a, a masters and phd program but part of the things we were trying to do in that program is to uh, question certain paradigms of education so it's an experimental stage and i don't know whether it will be successful or not we have had two to three batches going through it but part of what we do in the first year course for example in our masters in english sociology and philosophy 
is actually to bring students of different disciplines and sit in the same class. So we think literature students who listen to philosophy and sociology, uh, you know, it enriches their understanding of uh, the English literature. And philosophy students who listen to English literature and sociology, it enriches their understanding of philosophy. And uh, it is a model which we are, as I said, experimenting and trying out to see what we, how we can develop new paradigms of uh, teaching and learning. So it's, we are as much students in this experiment. Uh, but I'm glad to say that at least for the preliminary response to it, we are, at least the, my faculty and I are somewhat happy about it, but we have a very long way to go. Uh, it is in that context that, uh, uh, you know, we, when we design the course, one of the courses we teach for our students is actually called Thinking and Imagination. And we don't teach courses by disciplines, but by themes. And for us, a central question has been about one thing. One was about reading and writing and thinking and imagination. So we've been trying to engage with this question in our own way of trying to see where does this question of thinking arise? What are its essential relationship to education and so on? And uh, then the title, once I thought that maybe it's an opportunity to talk about thinking and learning within, as part of this uh, series, then the, the point of Maggie Noodles was an automatic choice. Uh, one, because, um, you know, I think Maggie Noodles is soon going to replace, if not already replace, uh, the Punjabi tandoori as an Indian national dish. <laughs> it's become one of the most popular versions of food for children and I think for adults. Uh, just the other day, I saw a whole packet, uh, which is called a family pack, a huge Maggie Noodle pack. Uh, and I must add a disclaimer, this talk is not sponsored by Maggie Noodles <laughs> or they have not done anything uh, to bring me here. But I think Maggie Noodles to me was a very important symptom of something about, not just education, but something about what is happening in our society. On the one hand, um, you know, I find that all my students love Maggie Noodles. I think any campus, I'm sure any of your student campuses, uh, Maggie noodles. Is, uh, there's something about Maggie noodles of this the idea of instant and the idea of less work to get some particular product which they feel very happy with. And ironically, mothers love it. Um, it cuts down huge cooking and also it uh, makes the children shut up for half an hour. So it replaces the TV in some sense. You know, children seem to love it so much. Mothers love it. And um, you know, this popularity that has spawned the whole notion of popularity of instant foods and instant technologies and this whole idea of instant culture, which seems to have become so much a part of our day-to-day -day life. So as a part of my exploration here today is actually I'm doing something um, subvertive and I should be saying it if I'm doing something subvertive, but the, uh, what I'm trying to do is to actually look at the relevance of philosophy in looking at contemporary situations. So, uh, I'm saying this right at the beginning so we understand why I'm talking about Nagi noodles and instant cultures. Um, so, you know, to make a real leap, and I'm saying this uh, half facetiously, if you look at um, what is happening with uh, degrees today, PhD degrees, people want it, if not in two minute PhD degrees, it's two year PhD degrees. And I know there are cases where there have been instant PhD degrees. Students who come to our, uh, not our class, uh, I mean in general, uh, from many other students we get, they want instant packaging of great thinkers. So if you want to talk to them about, you know, some seminal philosophy uh, thinker and writer, they want it in very neat packages, which you just cook in five minutes. Plato in two minutes, Aristotle in four minutes, uh, and Buddha in six minutes, and so on. So the point is, what is, how do we respond to the challenges teachers? I mean, I think there is, it's easy to dismiss these students and say, that they want to take a shortcut, they want to take an easy way out of the hard task of learning. But I think if I do that, I'm missing uh, understanding them from their perspective, from the technological culture they belong to. So to me, it's a question of negotiation with them and try to understand what are the implications of this instant uh, gratification that you need and how do we as teachers actually confront it. This has become such a, uh, you know, I'm sure many of you are aware of this. When we look at BA students who come to us, um, you know, we of course take students from any discipline, undergraduate. But we find that most of them tell us that even today, at least from Bangalore, uh, the best colleges in Bangalore still are working with the guidebooks. Um, and you know, of course, the PowerPoint phenomena all over in all classes. So these are all, I think, part of a larger culture. And we want to make sense of that culture. And that, of course, is a very large philosophical project. So I want to make sense of that culture by looking at the context of education and by actually looking at just one specific question. Um, and that is actually about the claim that in today's world, 
there is no time for thinking no time for thinking is a kind is a phrase which is used across different contexts and seems to suggest that among the many things that we do we don't seem to find some amount of space and time to be able to do some kind of notions of reflection so um i have been trying to make sense of what it means in a larger context and i'm going to give you some examples of how people have approached this question um i think all of us who are in academic field know this more and more that if you look at what is happening to teachers in universities and other departments and so on there is a lot of pressure one to produce to publish to do administrative job to raise funds to teach and so on and very often we tend to feel that there is no time to actually do something meaningful when we are doing so many things so it's almost that we are in a constant anxiety about doing things and uh, and you know when you reap when you uh, use this idea of constant anxiety to do against a more traditional understanding of reflection as something which needs leisure and space and time then we see where the conflict of uh, thinking and no time for thinking comes now this um, uh, you know i think uh, people argue that technologies of today have actually increases anxiety uh, definitely the email is a very anxious creating phenomena uh, sms and cell phones also do this uh, you know it, it has got a very different technological culture associated with it we also see that on the other hand if you remove these constraints of let's say publishing <coughs> teaching administrative work and raising funds then there's a much larger question in uh, academic environment which is the question of accountability and that i find uh, you know earlier before at manipal i was in this place called nations for advanced studies for many years and that was primarily a research institute and we had this as deep a problem there about accountability especially accountability in the social sciences and humanities which unlike the sciences where there are thousands of journals to publish and so you have very clear matrices for evaluating how do you actually evaluate uh, notions of production in the social sciences and humanities and standardly using these matrices like uh, numbers of papers published journal impact factors etc do not seem to work as effectively in these disciplines so there is on the one hand questions of accountability where when you expect teachers to be paid well and the and of course the sixth uh, pay scale or whatever is a very important player in the larger uh, academic environment i'm saying this because i'm now in a private university which doesn't take funds from the government and um, you know if you have to pay these pay scales it completely changes the economics of education so on the one hand it is that is a problem on the other hand there is this problem of accountability i mean what do we do for the pay we get and these are you know obviously very difficult questions and i'm sure somebody like professor krishna kumar can actually tell us a little more about it so i'm just going to look at this larger question of a uh, very simple question of uh, trying to understand the phrase no time to think it is also the title of a very interesting research project by two canadian uh, educationists who looked at um, you know as uh, many academic uh, i mean uh, uh, faculty uh, uh, teachers in many uh, uh, canadian universities and it was a very recent work and i'm just going to read very quickly about uh, what the results of that work was it's a very detailed study which begins with uh, uh, you know about the questionnaires and then more detailed follow up interviews and it is quite interesting to see some general framework i mean since the general results from that work um very interestingly this uh, work showed that the academics felt that they were better networked but quote they were also more isolated and this is a question which repeatedly comes back in this kind of a networked world where we are in much greater contact with many more people but the feeling of isolation i, I remember professor babu talia yesterday was telling me at jnu that when he is in his office he thinks that's the world is at his fingertips and that's really the point that if you are the world is at your fingertips and you are the only citizen of that world then what is the role of the others around you and i'm saying this because eventually in very important models of education you come back to the notion of community and interaction with the other this is the very important dovian model which uh, you know i'm just going to say a little bit about but uh, according to the results so she did find that they were more network but they felt more isolated um they also felt many people felt that the new environment this is largely about the technological environment with all its uh, consequent attendance on uh, you know teaching etc uh, etc et uh, uh, they felt that it made them better connected more productive and so on but they also claim that this led to stress and this uh, mapping of stress 
is between a variety of levels, between fa fa in, the, in the family, between colleagues and so on. Um, they also found that uh, they had problems of coping and very interestingly, uh, quite a few, uh, I think it's about 25 or 30% of the people have developed um, new food allergies because of the larger stress of coping. It's just the kind of ways of dealing with people all the time. Um, and they also developed short-term memory loss. And again, very interestingly, uh, according to this, this, uh, this work, 45% of women develop short-term memory loss versus 25% of men. Um, paradoxically, many felt that they're being more isolated. And what I think is more interesting and something which I think captures the, what is happening to us in our own, in my own experience, in this kind of uh, technological world in the context of education is that 57% said that they were reacting and not acting on their own initiative. I think that's something, you know, which many of us, uh, even in the larger research context, very often people come to us and say, can you write this, can you do this, can we come to this conference and so on. Very often the, the capacity to set up your own agenda for doing your independent research, etc., seems to be getting uh, somewhat diluted. So. Um, uh, uh, one, and this is another very interesting one, one professor pointed out that she was speaking less and less with people around her. But more <laughs> short conversations, which are relatively meaningless conversations, with many others. So she's speaking less and less with people around her, but a lot more of shorter conversations with many more people around her, because of which she felt she was losing her political consciousness. Another professor points out how phone conversations have been replaced by email so much that there's a real absence of voice which has consequences. I mean, these are responses, you know, which are just give us an indication of the larger uh, problems. And very interestingly, uh, most of them, over 65% of the respondents, eventually felt that they do not have free time to think. And this is the point which I want to understand. And that's where I begin with this point about what does it mean to say when people say they, have, they do not have free time to think? Because they also commented they are becoming loners since all information is in their offices. And they were giving examples of how even weekly seminars, which they used to have, were stopped because they don't have time. And for that professor, she felt that they were giving a wrong message to students about learning because she believed that learning was a community activity and you were engaging with others and so on, and it was not happening if this is the kind of situation. You know, there are, I think, um, uh, with many of these very interesting projects on uh, trying to understand the status of education today, uh, there are other, for example, there's another very interesting study which points out how students' perception of education, why they get educated, has changed radically over the last 40-50 uh, years. Uh, there was, um, uh, you know, uh, one uh, report which points out how a majority of students in the 60s, when they asked why were they getting educated, they said for meaningful philosophy of life. And when today, when they were asked them, they, most of the respondents said because they want to be well off financially. And I think we see this very much in our own students, in our own experiences. There is a kind of a global phenomena which some educationists have called as academic capitalism. And they try and understand this in the context of the way teaching has changed, the course structures have changed, the technologies have changed, and how institutionally education institutions are tying up across the world. Now, what is then my response to it as a philosopher? How do I want to bring philosophy into reflecting on this problem of just the simple question that there is no time to think? So one, you could begin by asking why think at all? Why is thinking, why does it have so much premium in education? What is really the understanding of thinking and the role of thinking in education? And two, uh, although this may sound uh, you know, polemical, but uh, to me it's a very important question. Why do we need time to think? What is the relationship between thinking and time? So as I said, in a way, uh, what I'm trying to do is not get you into the nitty gritties of some boring philosophical ideas, but actually, uh, you know, I'm just taking you on a, a journey with me on how to think about this problem of saying no time to think. And when I start on that, I just want to ask, what does this question of thinking have to do uh, with education or with anything else? And very interestingly, uh, if you look at the the theme of thinking, there are two disciplines which are very close, for, for both of whom thinking is the central concern. So, um, it, I, you know, whether I say it or not, there are again educationists um, who have written that the central concern for education is thinking. 
and what would constitute thinking as you know has led to enormous amount of literature in this what what would we call as thinking and at one level at a very fundamental level we understand why thinking is so important <laughs> in education because education cannot be just a transmission of ideas and facts and that somehow your capacity to link them together constitutes what is the process of learning in a very loose sense and the idea of taking facts and linking them together in very complex ways is in a is in the most fundamental sense the idea of thinking thinking does thinking is this relational act which is able to do this job and therefore i think intuitively we would understand that much more than transmission of information much more than the powerpoint uh, essence the capacity to digest them together put them together is uh, something which we would probably consider as thinking now um what wh how you know to, to why would we think uh, uh thinking in this context of learning makes is very important for education one uh, very important way of understanding this is that it makes a student autonomous you are no longer dependent on the teachers to tell you everything you are actually able to work through on your own and these are the very standard early responses to questions of education and therefore you find that there has been a large amount of uh, effort put into uh, trying to uh, privilege this notion of critical thinking i think in almost all the very various educational interventions the question of critical thinking becomes very important and again there have been people who have been asking these questions of what constitutes critical thinking and so on now i'm just going to give you one example of the intervention in this uh, with from the educationists and i'm using uh, somebody um, who professor krishna kumar knows very well and will probably correct me if i am not doing the correct interpretation it's uh, uh, john dewey's uh, uh, you know uh, uh, emphasis on the idea of reflection as very central to the act of uh, learning now um you know i uh, there is this is very interesting work by carol rogers who works on dewey and the idea of reflective thinking where she points out in terms of her practice as a teacher one of the greatest difficulties of uh, engaging with the idea of thinking unlike the idea of transmitting facts and so on is that it's very difficult to assess you don't know when you have transmitted thinking have the students learned thinking how do you assess it how do you evaluate it and so on so as part of this larger problem she was trying to see uh, how we could actually use uh, dewey's idea of thinking and uh, look at what do we might have meant when he emphasizes the idea of reflection as a very central uh, core of uh, this uh, process of thinking process um in uh, from looking at dewey's idea of thinking she points out uh, four criteria which i'm just saying this is a background so i think we'll be able to connect some points uh, from what constitutes thinking uh, the four criteria which she gets from dewey uh, for the idea of reflection is that one it's a meaning making process that gives continuity to learning so uh, definitely in all processes of learning we learn many things or we well we we get inputs of many things it could be facts it could be ideas it could be concepts the first capacity for learning already happens in this dewey and model with this kind of a meaning making process and the meaning making process is what gives continuity to thinking in all the ways by which we talk about thinking thinking is a temporal process it seems to happen in time and the way in which for dewey's understanding of education uh, and the importance of reflection is that one it's a meaning ma uh, uh, making process and two it's a systematic rigorous disciplined way of thinking rooted in scientific inquiry and three it has to be community community based and four it should value human growth now these four if you like are uh, you know characteristics of reflection for doing and this fits in larger uh, well with this aim of education for doing and the aim of education for doing was not just intellectual growth but also moral and emotional growth and uh, with a commitment to democratic values and his book on education and democracy uh, like his book on how to think were very important uh, were very important influences on education is now uh, this kind of a way of approaching the question of thinking uh, uh has two points one do we wants to distinguish between ways of thinking which could include stream of consciousness beliefs and so on as against a particular form of thinking which is reflective thinking with these characteristics and two he would um, uh and this i think is somewhat of a problem which people have taken a lot from dewey which is his uh, 
almost synonymous usage of reflective thinking with the scientific inquiry or the scientific method. So the question which uh, you know people have been asking, I mean, some of this work which I've been looking at is this question of what does it have to, you know, what if you want to step away from the paradigm of scientific method as, a con as an example of critical thinking? Or, I mean, this case, we mean that the scientific method, which it's often making an hypothesis out of the experience, and I think Dewey is a very important contribution here, and I'm saying this particularly in the context of this larger <coughs> dialogue which I have with Professor Gopal Guru on this topic, is on the uh, idea of experience. And experience plays a very fundamental role to the process of learning. So for Dewey, uh, making a hypothesis out of the experience and then subjecting it to experimentation are processes which are corresponds to reflective thinking. And uh, you can see the first basic models of what we would call scientific inquiry and so on. Now you could, uh, I mean there have been I think very interesting uh, set of ideas around it and very briefly just to conclude this part of uh, Dewey's uh, uh, the, you know, their, understanding of reflection, uh, Dewey also makes a very important point that reflection is a set of attitudes. And these attitudes include, uh, you know, this set of right attitudes which include wholeheartedness, directness, open-mindedness, and responsibility. Now, uh, these are, you know, these are virtues which we think constitutes, uh, you know, serious teaching and serious learning. So in a sense, by looking at this, we don't necessarily have, uh, we're not really re looking at something which is very alien to many of us as teachers, because you do think in a class in teaching, you want to bring in this attitude of wholeheartedness, uh, directness, open-mindedness, and responsibility. Um, very interestingly, as I said, you know, I'm just using Dewey as a paradigm example of the question of thinking and how thinking has been taught by educationists, and there is, as I said, enormous interesting literature on this. If you look at, um, as I said, for, for education, thinking becomes a central concern. Very interestingly, there is yet another discipline for whom thinking is the central concern. And I'm saying this uh, uh, with, uh, you know, I say knowing that some people might want to disagree with this. Um, the discipline which, for which thinking is a central subject matter is philosophy. Philosoph many philosophers have actually defined uh, philosophy as thinking about thinking. And it's a very nice uh, description for me. And I find my students actually respond very favorably to that uh, idea. And there are enough philosophers who have actually written explicitly about philosophy as an act of thinking about thinking. So I begin with this two interesting, uh, with this coincidence between the question of thinking being of central concern to education and the question of thinking being a central concern to philosophy. And then ask the question about the, how to f ask this philosophical question about no time to think. Now, if you look at the long literature on philosophers who wrote about thinking, you will, of course, find in the grand uh, rationalist tradition and the tradition of reason, people coming back to this question of thinking uh, in various ways. Um, there are many examples. We can go through almost all the uh, uh, famous uh, writers. I'll just very briefly point out one who has been great, of great influence, at least in the Western tradition, which is Kant. Uh, Kant, in his, uh, on, on his great essay on the Enlightenment, comes back to this point that thinking by oneself is the spirit of the Enlightenment. And thinking by oneself um, means that you always uh, have to be careful about just depending on others for, your, for doing your thinking. Um, he argues that since we, at least as adults, have the capacity for understanding within ourselves, we should not expect tutelage or be guided by another in, think in our thinking. Now, these, uh, you know, the way, therefore, for Kant to be able to do this independent thinking on one's own is to have notions of courage and resolution. And you have to have courage and resolution to get out of our dependency on others to do our thinking. And I think that kind of a movement towards saying, I don't want others to think for myself, becomes a very important part of eventually what we would call as an autonomous individual, uh, to the extent that we would think children, you know, even in their very young age, in their <coughs> teens, would also say, look, I have my authority, I don't want you to think for me on what I should be doing, and so on. And uh, for, uh, for Kant, he says, in contrast, laziness and cowardice are the reason for people who do not think for themselves. You can see, you know, this idea that somehow the uh, enlightened individual is able to think for herself freely and act freely becomes a very important motto in our later formulations of the idea of thinking. Um, 
there are uh, just to give you a counter to this large uh, you know this large lineage of so called rationalist thinkers or thinkers who emphasize the role of reason as fundamental to the idea of humans fundamental to the idea of individuals in a modern society we have somebody uh, uh, like heidegger heidegger is a more complex philosopher but he he gives a series of lectures on thinking and it is uh, um, you know called and it is published as a book called what is called thinking it's a fascinating entry into just reading something for the fun of it uh, whether you get something out of it you know since we are not in an instant uh, world and as philosophers we don't believe in that so it's okay but it's just great fun to just read it and see what is this thing about he is actually thinking about thinking in talking about what is called thinking it's a set of is a set of lectures which are uh, transcribed into the text but in there i, I think heidegger makes a very interesting point which i think just to add to the complexity of thinking among philosophers it's useful to keep this in mind um he you know uh, for example this thinking is a skill which we need to cultivate um in reading a book for example which we learn we need to free ourselves from the author's thinking now heidegger criticizes the reduction of thinking to logic and dialectics as in kant and the enlightenment and he also makes this uh, comment which is a little bit later heidegger repeatedly that science does not think and that has led to various people trying to make sense of what he means by science is he anti science etc but uh, he's uh, i think to me he's giving a useful contrast to do his emphasis on scientific inquiry and reflection when he says science does not think but for heidegger science complements thinking these become very important uh, togetherness between the two uh, and actually uh, when heidegger opens up the question of thinking he points out that thinking has a close relationship with language and memory and in doing so he is also doing something which uh, contemporary accounts of thinking have to encounter which is that thinking is not just this mental act which happens in our minds in private in some funny way something happens and things go click 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 but rather he is trying to relate it to social practices and lived experience of people in that that uh, questions of language and memory play a very important role in not in the conclusions of thinking or not in particular aspects of thinking but in the very nature of thinking and therefore when we look for example at some of the very interesting questions about thinking you would ask the question about what is thinking's relationship to language it's a question i find very fruitful in many of our discussions on thinking because you know when we get students from different uh, linguistic backgrounds we often begin by doing an exercise by asking do you think better in other languages so when people who come to us and say look i'm not able to write particularly in the, you know let's say the writing english as i mentioned so on very often we then try and work with them and saying when people say they have a problem with writing is it a problem with the language or is it a problem with thinking and therefore we try and ask them to see if they will write the same thing if they are not able to write it in english if you give it to them in kannada for example in karnataka or hindi or something will they write that uh, easier is it more easier for them to do that writing and then we try and uh, look at what is this relationship between language and thinking and there are this uh, again very important uh, questions about gender and thinking do women think differently is a very interesting question to ask um and you know if you look at the long history of thinking you do find uh, in this history of thinking uh, the thinking has always been used as a category to rank people and rank cultures actually you see this in the colonial discourse you see this in uh, you know very important experiments about women one of the experiments all of you might know well is looking at the size of the uh, cranium or the brain in order to correlate it to uh, intelligence or the capacity to think and um, you know there's a very interesting uh, paper which uh, points out that you know it worked fine because they used to say that the men's head on average is bigger than the women's head and therefore men think better or whatever until they found out the elephants are very big heads <laughs> <laughs> so that went that theory but you know there have been long well established uh, truisms about thinking of this kind the question about culture and thinking do indians think differently from americans might look like a you know one of these culture studies questions but uh, if many of you might be aware of ak ramanujan's quite an influential piece uh, i i don't think it really sets out to answer what he asks but the uh, essay title is there an indian way of thinking uh, at least is making a gesture towards what is it to ask the question do cultures think differently do women think differently uh, there is actually in cognition a lot of very interesting questions about animal thinking do animals think differently and so on uh, do they think at all like humans and stuff like that now 
um, to me, one of the most powerful reasons why we have to engage with the question of thinking um, goes back to Hannah Arendt, and I'm sure many of you are aware of this, but just for completeness, I should mention Hannah Arendt's very influential work on, and in her invocation of the idea of banality of evil, when she talks about the Eichmann trial, when she goes to cover Eichmann's trial, and she writes a series of reports for New Yorker, and she invokes the phrase banality of evil, which many Jewish intellectuals are very unhappy about because she thought she was diluting the whole Nazi uh, atrocities by saying that evil is so common, that the person who did Eichmann looked like an ordinary person. But in, all, in the end of when she is writing about this Eichmann, she only comes back to a very interesting, very, very simple, beautiful point, that the real problem with Eichmann is that Eichmann did not think. That's all. So it is not a justification for what he did, but it is an observation from her that when she sat through this whole... Uh, you know, this whole, uh, uh, they had this, um, what do you call it, trial. And she said, you know, here's a person uh, who looks like he's not menacing, but his only problem is he does not think. But to her, she also makes another important point, that it is the bureaucracy which causes you not to think. And I should be very careful when I say this at IAC, but, you know, uh, it is the bureaucracy which has this very important capacity to stop people making, uh, to stop uh, making people think. And I think that question about uh, the role of thinking, which has been taken over by education in various ways in terms of thinking for social consciousness, thinking as creative uh, thinking, uh, creation of new ideas and so on, has been uh, extremely influential. Uh, but when, when philosophers have looked at thinking, and I want to uh, make a very general comment, which again, if you look at it more particularly, may not really be very correct, but just for my purposes here, I want to say uh, educationists would like to look at thinking in terms of skills of thinking. What constitutes skills of thinking? How can you transmit skills of thinking and so on? For philosophers, although both of them are concerned with the central concept of thinking, for philosophers, the fundamental concern is the nature of thinking. What is thinking really all about? How do we understand this thing called thinking? Now, if you look at how philosophers have understood it, um, there are, as I said, many questions of uh, language and gender and culture and so on. There is also a very interesting way um, uh, which I should mention because I think it's a very nice, uh, interesting argument by Gilbert Ryle, uh, very um, good analytical philosopher from the British tradition, who actually points out that, you know, when you are talking about thinking, that thinking as an act is not actually doing anything. So he begins with a very simple question, what do you do when you think? And this is a wonderful phenomenological exercise. So uh, you ask people, what are you doing in your thinking? And you know the most famous thing, like many of you are sitting here, the pose of the thinker. And the famous thinker, uh, Rodin's uh, sculpture. But you know, I have often found, with many of my students who are sitting like this, they're not thinking. They're probably <laughs> sleeping or daydreaming. But you can't distinguish whether they're thinking or daydreaming or sleeping. So we ask the question, how do you actually know you're thinking? And this is a really nice, interesting exercise to do for ourselves, forget about others. How do we actually know what we are doing when we are thinking? I know what I'm doing when I'm eating. I know what I'm doing when I'm running. What I'm, if you ask somebody to characterize, what are you doing when you are thinking? Uh, you know, very often we there's a lot of muddle about it because we're not very clear what we do. One wonderful characterization of it, which somebody like Gilbert Ryle will have problem with, is that when we think, we know that we think. You know, the, the proof that we think, uh, in our own sense of our experience, is because we listen to ourselves. We talk to ourselves. Thinking becomes a talking to oneself, which has a long tradition from Plato and which has also been discounted by many, uh, you know, uh, where Ryle would have problems there and so on. But I'm just saying, uh, I'm just invoking Ryle here to make a very interesting point, which he does, uh, just to illustrate to you uh, something, you know, which I will come back to in the end, which is that when he says that, um, you know, he comes up with this very interesting uh, characterizations of what he called adverbial verbs, and, and he says, although don't take this label very seriously, uh, he's just drawing our attention to a special class of these verbs, which look like as if they're doing something, but they're not actually doing anything. So it looks like when we do thinking, it's like running and eating, and that you're actually doing something, but, uh, you know, according to Ryan, you're not actually doing something. And he gives the example of hurry, you know, hurrying. And he says, if you're asking, if you if, if told that someone is hurrying, we have not been told what he is doing. You can ask if I'm eating, you can ask what am I doing. If I said, oh, somebody is hurrying, and you ask, what do you, what do you mean? What is the action associated with hurrying? Uh, all you can say is that he is doing whatever he is doing at an abnormally high speed. 
<laughs> the action is not in hurry. Action is just a character, classy, you know, given as a quality of doing something else. And uh, he may be hurriedly walking or typing or reading or humming, etc., etc. And the point he's trying to say is that there are many such verbs that we use. So he's actually alerting us to the possibility that we may think we are doing something very profound when we are thinking, but actually we may not be doing anything at all. And he gives a series of examples for these adverbial verbs, uh, hesitating, uh, persevering, obeying, attending, rehearsing, playing, pretending. Pretending is a very uh, important point that I comes back to in the context of thinking. You know, we do a lot of pretending when we are uh, thinking and so on. So, um, in, you know, there is something which is very uh, interesting about this kind of what he calls as infra-doing, not real doing, infra-doing. And what is interesting to me about infra doing is that it eventually brings us back to the fundamental question which I'm going to address here today. And that is the question about going back to the phrase, no time for thinking. After telling you what thinking could be, I want to come to the second most difficult term in that sentence. So no time for thinking, you know, uh, by looking at something called about thinking, I want to look at the question of time and ask what does the question, what does time really have to do with thinking? If you look at what Ryle is suggesting to us, like this infra doing, not really doing something, then you don't really need time to not do anything. You need time to do something. I need time to walk, I need to time to lift something and act. But if I'm not doing anything, what is the relationship of time to not doing anything? And there is something which is, I think, very mysterious about it. And of course, philosophers like to make mysteries out of simple things. But let me assure you that time is really mysterious in a lot of ways. And especially in the context of thinking. And I want to now ask a question, which is what I will leave. You know, you wanted a big question for the lecture and so on. At least I can give you two or three big questions around this. Uh, because I really don't know how to answer this. Uh, but I'm taking uh, courage in that Professor Krishna Kumar is here and he can help us answer that question. Um, and this is the question of time. And I want to ask the question. Um, you know, the, the first point is, you have this problem that we have no time to think. On the other problem we have is that thoughts, by definition, are already temporal. And this is something which comes right from the Descartian tradition when you classify the mind and the body as different kinds of substances, kinds of things, if you like. Uh, but what is so characteristic of the mind or thinking is that thinking occupies time. It doesn't occupy space. My thought that it's 6.30 now may not have a location. I can't say it is, even though I'm speaking here at IIC, I can't say it's really, my thought is not in this room above my head or sitting in this table. But it has a time. You can index it with time. You can index it with length. The, how long is my thought? So a lot of confused thoughts may actually be very long. And maybe, you know, short thoughts may be very simplistic, but they have a length. And they are time length, time duration. So here is this point that seems to be that Thoughts, which are somehow related to thinking, are always temporal. But when we talk about thinking, we are invoking this question of no time to think. Now, the first point about no time to think. So I'm just going to give you a very rapid summary, a two-minute Maggie Noodle uh, definition of time, in the hope not to do uh, what Maggie Noodle is doing, but actually to make us think about a different question in the context of education. The first point, when we say no time to think, you'll have to ask, what kind of a time am I talking about? So the moment I ask this, then of course we are asking, considering the possibility that there are many kinds of time. And definitely, when I say no time to think, you would say, there is no clock time to think. And then I will then begin with a very problematical claim that clock time is no time at all. If you want to believe that it is time, you are very welcome. But actually, sad but true, it's not time at all. And there is a long history of why clock time is not time. In fact, I think one very interesting uh, way of looking at it, and I'm just taking poetic license in this, is this observation that if you go to South Pole, there is no time in South Pole. You know, if there is no time in South Pole in the sense, because all the longitudes meet there, there is no time for South Pole. So there are 24 time zones, 18 or 24, I think it's 24. And uh, the story they talk about South Pole is, you know, South Pole has a flag which marks the pole. It's the proof of North Pole also, but North Pole is moving things, so you, don't, you can't put a flag at a particular point. But South Pole is a flag, you go there, and if you go take a, you know, Pradarshanam around the flag, go around it once, 
you actually cut all the 24 time zones because all the longitudes meet there. So you will go through all the 24 time zones by just walking a few steps around the flag. And south, uh, the South Pole by itself does not have time. So I want to ask this question, what do we make sense of this claim that South, zone has no time, uh, south Pole has no time? What does it imply to us? What kind of a time are we talking about? Now the question of clock time is, um, is just one of the many puzzles about time. And so I'm saying all this not just to, uh, uh, you know, uh, any excuse to talk about time is always very welcome, but I'm not really trying to do that because I want to ask this question in the context of education. I want to understand what is the nature of time experience? What is the nature of temporal experience and learning? And particularly in the context of education. And I'm trying to formulate that question. Um, so, I, so let me look at the various aporias, the problems of time, which are, you know, which make time extremely difficult to get hold of. I'm saying this because when you say there's no time to think, I want to ask you what time, what kind of time don't you have to think? Okay, just to phrase the uh, question for you again. Now, just like the question about the South Pole, there are other very interesting points. And one is this very interesting question which a lot of linguists have worked extensively on, which is that time is always discovered, largely described through spatial metaphors. In fact, most of the expressions of time that you do are using images of space. There is no, really, there's no time words to actually capture our experience of time. So, for example, you would say uh, things like looking forward to tomorrow, troubles that lie behind us, music played all through the night. I'm just using some example from Gentner. Uh, there's, a, an, again, enormous work uh, done on uh, spatial metaphors uh, and spatial concepts in time, um, both from cognitive scientists like Lakoff and others, and also from linguists, uh, because there's something very interesting about language and time, that whole relationship of tense to verbs and so on. You know, how do you tense words and stuff? A very interesting uh, question there. Um, when you say, for example, a theory was proposed ahead of its time, and there are also examples of how we use the same kind of connotations in spatial and temporal verbs. You will say, at the corner, at noon, from here to there, from two o'clock to four o'clock. I mean, if two and four are markers of time, you use the same kind of prepositions in this case like you would do for, uh, uh, for space. But what is interesting, and this seems to be the case across languages, it's not that, although there are very interesting languages, uh, so-called tribal languages, where the question of uh, the future time and past time are radically different, but um, very often in most of these languages, and what is so astounding is, even though time is using spatial metaphors, it is using spatial metaphors of a line. It never uses a complex two-dimensional, three-dimensional space. So, for example, you would say terms the unidimensionally. That is, the relationship between space and time is that time is as if it is a spatial line, not a larger dimension. So, for example, the words we use to talk about time could be, um, uh, you know, front and back, etc. But you would you would not use, according to these linguists, terms like narrow time, wide time, shallow time, deep time. You know, these, uh, for example, depth is, uh, uh, in a, it captures the idea of more than one dimension. It's not a single uh, line. A line is really doesn't have a depth, it has a length. The moment you move into higher dimensions, you have depth. And we don't talk about, I mean, usually, you know, I'm sure creatively some people would want to talk about it that way, uh, but we don't normally talk about it. So although we use before and after for time, you would not use terms like right and left for time. Oh, this is right time and it's left time. You could ask why we don't use that. What is it about time that makes us, uh, you know, seemingly accept these linguistic constructs about time? Now, I'm saying this because I think there is something very important about uh, this reflection on time that can have a bearing on some questions, uh, at least in philosophy of education for me. Um, because there is this whole contention, and I, it's very difficult to make sense of it, but I think it's useful to make sense of it when I say there's no time to think. One that there are many, uh, I think, very insightful thinkers, insightful scientists. Uh, I would also put somebody like uh, a great, one of the greatest magicians of last century, uh, Kurt Godel, uh, and people like him who believe that time is unreal, that time does not exist at all. Now, this might seem to be a fancy of some kind of a philosophical exegesis of some small group of people saying that time does not exist. But there is a long tradition of very serious thinkers who, say, who claim that time does not exist. And what they mean by that, 
and I think this is a very interesting idea to consider. What they mean by that are two things. One, time is relational. Time is a word which we use to uh, describe events which happen. The only thing which is real in the world are events and events keep happening and time is the way we make sense of events. Our relationship between events makes sense of what is called time. You do, you have, this is the famous Leibnizian model for both space and time. Leibniz would argue there's nothing called space. All that there are in the world are objects and space is nothing but the relationship between objects. What this does, I'm just saying this very briefly because it allows us to actually ask the question about what kind of time do I want in education? You know, when I'm saying this, I'm saying as if we have the, the freedom to choose our type of time. But I think as a, uh, as a philosophical question, there is a lot of, uh, you can get out of this question. Now, typically time is used, you know, in almost all traditions of time, you begin with uh, the definition of time arises from change, the question of change. You, have, you recognize, you perceive change, and you, you invoke the idea of time to make sense of change. If you use this model for thinking, it becomes very difficult. I mean, there are interesting work on this to sh uh, show this, how um, you cannot consistently come up with a theory of change to account for thinking in terms of time. You could also look at uh, other very important ideas of time, which is time as a container model. Uh, you see this with the Greeks, you see this with the Indian philosophical thought. And in particularly in various Indian philosophies, uh, there is a lot of realist commitment to time. Uh, time as cause, for example, cause for the origin and destruction of the universe. Uh, time as death to devour, uh, you know, Kala's relationship with devouring. Um, also to count. And there is this one very nice uh, strain in Mahabharata which defines time as Sutradhar. Sutradhar of the universe permitting events and preventing, preventing them. So it's actually conducting the whole set of events which happen in the world. So my point is, if you look at these questions of time, uh, what is it that we, uh, what kind of time are we talking about in the context of thinking? Now, there is one aspect of time which repeatedly comes to all these philosophers, and that is the point that time, and this is the thing which a lot of modern philosophers try and struggle to make sense of which is that time seems to define our experience into three parts, past, present, and future. What really, you know, it seems to be that time is made up of a series of nows, instants, and each now allows us to differentiate and understand something called the past, and the present now, and the future. And for example, Ricker's uh, wonderful um, description of this in his uh, monumental time and narrative volumes begins with just this point about this aporia of time, about the problem of now. And the problem of now is, now does not have a duration, now is an instant, and you can never catch now, because the moment you utter now, it's already the next now. Not utter, the moment you cognize now, it's already the past, and you have a new now. This problem about time has been very difficult to understand and get rid of. And what I want to suggest to you very quickly is that much of this arises from very particular uh, histories of time. And when we say there is no time to think, and when we look at how the clock time runs our lives, I want to point out very briefly this historical entry into the question of clock time. Because much of the way we talk about time, and time running away, time as a line, which we don't have control over, it's completely, you know, we can never catch it, we can never go back, etc. These ideas about time, which are so much internal to us, actually come from a very important moment in European history, when the time gets mathematized. And if you do not have that moment, which actually happens with uh, Newton's teacher, Isaac Newton's teacher, Barrows, who was very influential for Newton, and who proposes this idea that time is a line, what he calls as a right line, R-I-G-H-T, right line, which is only one direction, and it is going on moving, but like a line, it's made up of points. And the nows are points in a line. You know, and that is perhaps one of the most difficult uh, most emancipatory moment in the development of physics, but also one of the most non-emancipatory moments in our experience of time. Because the moment you have understood time as this line, which is made up of instants like spatial line, you have actually brought in a completely different set of problems to the questions of time. And that is, remains to us in such, a, in, in such a central way, because almost all the notions of modern time come from this. So people, for example, who have looked at cultures of time, uh, you know, often point out, and you can see this in the colonial discourse repeatedly with various writings on clock time, is that the clock 
actually is one of the greatest revolutions in the world. It changes the world in very profound ways. And clock time, the idea that clock is somehow capturing the question of time, you know, making sense that of the movement of time, has actually been used in various ways. If you look at the colonial discourse on uh, India by the British, you will find them invoking the the point that Indians cannot make sense of clock time. We do, we cannot be ordered by clock time. In some, you know, we always come late for meetings and so on. Uh, nothing has changed. Um, you know, the point about time, in a sense, culturally, was this: that you have to consider the possibility that time was slower before clock time was introduced. Just as much as I would say. Time is faster today than after these kinds of our experiences which have come through technology. And uh, I think the suggestion that time was slower, as if time is moving slow before clock was introduced, is a wonderful poetic metaphor which, uh, which I like to use because it makes me understand certain kinds of processes about time. And with capitalism, we really see the complete shift of these ideas of time coming from mathematical time. So for example, you have the notion of um, uh, time as efficiency, Adam Smith, you have time as money, uh, Weber explicitly talks about time as money. And for Weber, time as money is a very important <coughs> shift in the idea of time, because time now becomes something which can be wasted, saved and spent. You can accumulate time, you can spend time, you can make interest on time, and you therefore have, in this Weberian ethos, you therefore have a moral duty towards time. The creation of moral values to time through this idea of, uh, you know, through, through this particular value means that, uh, as Weber would like to have it, wastage of time is for him the deadliest sin. It's a completely different theological reading. Although we should remember time, the idea of time and link with theology has been very long in all traditions, both in India and in the West. Uh, but the time as uh, deadliest sin and the time as moral value means that idle talk and leisure are actually bad and they become moral terms. And therefore, this uh, association of sin and guilt with leisure means that you have, you, I mean, these are very fundamentally related to this question of time to think, you know? And this question which Carol Rogers began by asking, how do we as educationists evaluate thinking? What do we mean by assessing teaching of thinking? It is, comes back to this question of, uh, questions of accountability of academic culture itself. What do I do when I'm saying I'm thinking for two years and going to write something profound after that? But why would somebody want to pay me for two years to, so that I can think about it profound? I mean, what kind of an attitude do you need towards educa education which seems to do this? Um, so, um, what I want to therefore conclude with is this simple question by asking, um, I, I, I should apologize for asking this question because I'm not sure it makes full sense. But I'm trying to think through this, so uh, I hope you'll pardon me for this. But I'm going to ask the question, what is the time that's relevant to education and to learning? If there are all these models of time which have accommodated very different kinds of cultural practices, uh, disciplinary practices, what kind of time is available? So when we say there is no time to think, I can start with the proposition that we do not have mathematical time to think. There is a clock time to think. Your clock is running too fast. We are doing too many things. We don't have time to think. But then it doesn't matter to me because the time you need for thinking is not clock time. Suppose I start with that proposition, okay? And it may be completely wrong, but if you uh, think through this with me, then you will find that there are other traditions of time that make sense of the time associated with thinking and learning. And one very good example of this is what has been called as phenomenological time. And the whole tradition of phenomenology in philosophy which comes back to the question of time in a completely different manner. And the idea of that is very simple. And the idea is that when you listen to a melody, a piece of music, what is the time consciousness that is present in that? And it's a very good example used by Husserl and many phenomenologists, which is that when I listen to a melody, a piece of sound, and my, my consciousness of it is doing something very interesting. One, it is unifying the piece of sound. At the same time of unifying the whole piece as one melody, it is able to distinguish different tones in the sound. It is able to know that these are the tones which constitute that unity. It is able to differentiate between the different tones. But at the end of it, it's able to give me a unified synthesis of that, that duration. This point that time is not an instant and now, but a duration, is extremely important to the phenomenology movement, whether it's with Bergson or with Husserl and others. 
what I think what it allows us to do, I mean Husserl goes on to then talk about three types of time, the object time, the world time, and then the subjective time, and an inner time consciousness and so on. But I think the, the, the reason why I'm running through this is basically to indicate to you that there are ways of understanding our own time experiences which are very different from clock time experiences. And I think that allows us a completely different entry into the question of learning and thinking because if we follow people like Dewey and philosophers who have talked about thinking, that there is something in the act of thinking which is a synthesis. Eventually, like music, there has to be an act of synthesis and unity in thinking. Otherwise, it's just a set of stream of consciousness like Dewey would say or a set of random thoughts which are just floating around. The moment of thinking happens when you are able to connect them in very different ways, in very complex ways, in very new ways. But what is that act of synthesis that uh, eventually defines that moment of thinking? That act of synthesis could be like this phenomenological moment, could be like the moment which you learn, which, which when you hear through a, a stream of music, you are able to do. Or like what Ricker would do when he goes back to narrative time and points to the idea of plot in a story as that thread which makes history, which connects events to make them history. And there is an idea that there is somehow in the capacity of thinking and learning, this idea of unity and synthesis, which is primarily that of a consciousness of time, that duration by which the synthesis and unity happens, is, what we, uh, uh, is how we actually experience time. And I think that allows us actually to do, um, uh, you know, uh, something uh, to understand time as something different from the clock time, the external time, uh, but also not make it you know completely personal and so-called subjective. Uh, but there are very specific uh, uh, ways by which we experience time in thinking and learning. So I will therefore end with a, a set of uh, three or four questions and actually one suggestion uh, to you know fit into what you would want. It. So I would uh, rephrase the whole question after talking about this by asking what views of time are relevant to recapture thinking in the instant age. You know, we have to accept the fact that there is something which is happening in our uh, technological interventions in time, in the belief that we do not have time, or in using technologies to constantly escape time. You know, uh, it's so difficult. Earlier when we used to travel in trains, people would be looking out of the window. You know, it's very difficult actually to see people look out of the window now because they are so busy looking at the cell. And I, I find that it's a great way of actually not interacting with anybody also. You know, I know people who actually, uh, when they're walking and they find somebody whom they don't want to speak, they just put their phone in their hand and they start talking. And you know, there is a, it gives you a kind of a way of looking at the world. And the part of the thinking, the idea of thinking, the having the time to think is actually, is, is a completely different cultural world. So I would ask the question, what views of time are relevant to recapture thinking in this instant age? And, uh, um, and therefore, in this question, what kind of time characterizes learning? I've already suggested some possibilities with it, but I think this to me is a very uh, open question. Uh, and finally, what I want to suggest directly is this, that why am I trying to do this kind of a very convoluted attempt to make sense of thinking and relating it to time, etc.? Because I think eventually, particularly in this instant age when there's so much anxiety around us to keep doing something or the other, uh, you will have to find a shelter for time. You have to find a place where time can go and rest, where it can be protected. You need an orphanage for different times. You need a shelter house for time. And philosophy can do that. If philosophy can do that, then you know what you can actually do in the context of when I mean philosophy, it could be philosophy as a discipline, philosophy as a worldview, etc. Uh, I'm not going to enter into this possibility of what philosophy is. In the context of education, what it means to me, therefore, is this larger question, uh, which I'm sure Professor Krishna Kumar is, uh, would agree, um, perhaps with some hesitation, I don't know, uh, is to introduce philosophy in schools. Um, you know, a lot of people who talk about philosophy, they say, you know, it's very confusing, you make people... When I uh, made philosophy a profession, uh, well-meaning friends and professional scientists would used to tell me, why don't you wait till you retire for you to philosophy? <laughs> and still it is a problem when we to want to attract students to do philosophy and so on. But I think like the French experiment which brought philosophy into schools, I think this kind of a self-awareness about simple things, and uh, if at all you, you, know, you go back to the most fundamental aspect of thinking, which again comes from 
uh, a philosopher who is often misunderstood as being very abstruse and so on, but to whom philosophy was the ideal of the sciences. Husserl, Edmund Husserl, who talked about phenomenology as a science of the sciences. And in his definition of phenomenology as a science of the sciences, he has a definition of science which he says, where nothing is taken for granted, where you do not, everything you believe is put into question. Now that kind of philosophical thinking, which can actually animate our thinking, our learning, has to begin, uh, in my view, uh, so it's almost like an advertisement for my profession. But the question for me as a, as a very important question of education is how do you introduce philosophy in schools? Therefore, I'll conclude by saying, uh, if you want to create more time for thinking, instead of saying no time for thinking, if you want to create more time for thinking, you should actually create more space for philosophy. Thank you so much. Um, thank you very much, um, Professor Sarukai. Um, friends, uh, you will agree uh, that there's only one way to describe this lecture or capture it in our memory by uh, saying that it's a lecture which mixes erudition with awakening. It um, touches on a range of issues uh, and we are um, um, free, in a way, to pick up um, uh, several of the uh, issues that he has uh, raised. Uh, the only constraint is his uh, key concept, time. Uh, uh, his hope that the school uh, can uh, create greater space for this instrument of um, thought uh, namely a subject called philosophy, is of course a very interesting proposal and uh, we do need to reflect on that. Uh, there is a range of issues that he um, touched on uh, that have to do with um, the modern world or modern life as such, uh, as iconized by um, um, Maggie Noodles. Um, the history of time in the uh, modern period of history um, is a history which is not particularly uh, um, kind uh, on people who wish to have time to think. Um, and in fact, he mentioned Dewey quite elaborately. Dewey often pointed out that um, the fact that something is stressed or emphasized in a certain period or certain kind of writing is the best proof that that must be in short supply. Um, uh, Dewey himself, as you know, was very concerned about the transformation of the America of his lifetime from being a country of uh, communities into a country which was becoming a place of manipulable publics. The book he wrote nearly two decades after his classic Democracy and Education, his last book that he wrote 20 years after that book, uh, the, the Public and Its Problems, is a, is a complaint against the corporatization of America, uh, the uh, growth of a certain kind of capitalism that uh, America began to symbolize across the world. Otherwise, the world in which Dewey had grown up was, a, was an America of small hamlets, uh, dispersed hamlets where people had to do something about life's problems and had to do something with their own ingenuity and imagination. And hence, Dewey's uh, um, uh, pedagogic uh, ideas about uh, making us inventive, uh, imaginative, and so on and so forth. This evening, we have quite a task if we were to follow in the footsteps of the philosopher that uh, Professor Sarukai has um, uh, placed in a very privileged position. He has also raised questions about academic life in our times, uh, what's happening to the academia. Um, he has also raised uh, a whole range of conceptual issues about uh, thinking, how we might define thinking, and so on and so forth. Uh, personally, what I find quite interesting is his hope, or the source of his hope, namely the school. Uh, interestingly enough, you know, the modern school which uh, is uh, full of this ambition to universalize itself 
to compel everyone to come to it, is actually a child of uh, industrialism. It's a child of capitalism. And it's not surprising that the one way in which it identifies time is by uh, tabularizing it. You know, in a school, the word time is best known for the hyphenated phrase timetable. Uh, it's in the tabular form that the school addresses time, in which there are slots. These slots are inviolable. Uh, these are actually territories in which identities are formed of teachers. Uh, these are territories in which children are boxed and have to actually learn to switch attention uh, from one to the next territory when the bell rings. It's the ultimate triumph of uh, behaviorism uh, that the school uh, becomes uh, such an authoritarian institution and it does so by using the instrument of time by controlling children with the help of time. Of course, it has other ways in which it controls human freedom, uh, stops people from uh, enjoying uh, autonomy in early life so that they get used to the idea of coming to a university uh, in good time. Uh, and it socializes them to live in a world which will be a bit worse by the time they get older. Uh, this, the modern school is a great historical institution. At this juncture, uh, can it accommodate another subject? Well, curriculum specialists would be delighted with this prospect. They will say, yes, one more <laughs> slot. Instead of 35 minutes, we will have 30-minute classes so that we can accommodate one class for philosophy. Now, that is the way the school uh, treats all such pleas. And it has accommodated so many subjects. It's a great instrumentalist institution, and it's flexible. Uh, in, in that sense, it's, uh, it's highly modern. Uh, it knows how to accommodate conflicting ideas and so on and so forth. So you, we are, you, you can also reflect on uh, the nature of this plea, what might be done about it and so on. So the, uh, uh, with the constraint that I see uh, doesn't allow people who run after 8.15, as I'm told, the outer limit uh, of our, uh, availability of time this morning, this evening, and time means space in this case. Um, you are free to ask questions, uh, and uh, I'd be happy, Professor Saruk, I would like to respond to some of them. Uh, I'll reserve my time for the end, which will be about, maybe I'd like to reflect on some of these issues at the end uh, for about five minutes. But please uh, feel free, and I understand that there's a mic for those who are yeah, Yes, ask the questions. The first yes. Yes. Keep your questions brief, so that Dewey's second favorite idea is addressed, okay, namely democracy. Yeah, I just want to start by mentioning that I disagree with the claim that at the South Pole, time has no meaning. Because when you are saying, explaining this, you are assuming time is solar time. Your sun is the time. If it is not the solar time, if it is the cesium clock time or pendulum time, time would be exist even in South Pole also. So it depends on that. And then coming back to your general theme, I would like to say that there is a personal time. We organize the events and the perceptions that we get in a certain order. This is a basic time. And there is other times like clock time and solar time. And the lucky point is we can correlate our time with the other times. And to answer your question, I think you yourself answered the question earlier. I don't think it is really philosophy that is needed. What is really needed is what you quoted earlier. Each person has to think for himself. Because ultimately, time doesn't rest in philosophy, it rests in yourself. And as Kant said, if you know how to think for yourself, to some extent, you solve the problem of time. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. We'll take four or five comments uh, in the run and then see if we can respond. Yes. Two short reflections. I really like the last point that giving. It's not on. It's on here. It's on. It's on. I mean, uh, 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 philosophy as habitat for time. Actually, I don't know, you, you didn't miss out the point, but this is exactly the original idea of Plato. As a thinkers as uh, moose. I mean, we call it German moose. I mean, uh, thinkers don't do anything. Uh, don't do anything, yeah? but think. Yeah, that's the problem. We, we do have students who do nothing, but it uh, doesn't mean that they think. So uh, that is one point I really like. And the first thing about the action and reaction, uh, I think it's important, especially the creative thinking, 
that it's always an action. It's either a rhetoric or writing. So you all know that, like in search, you can't really think and write. As we write uh, for Plato, who actually favored uh, speaking, and <coughs> no, yeah, he, he didn't like that writing part. Uh, and then Plato, and then uh, Derrida, who says, writing is thinking. Yeah? So you write and think. So that, I think that action part is so important, and that there the time is associated, whether we act properly while uh, as a uh, and boss for thinking. So that's my question. Thank you. So my name is my name is Dushant. Uh, I'm actually from the Indian Express. I just want to make a couple of quick comments. Um, you know, this intrusive te uh, culture of technology that we're living in. I feel it's quite dangerous because look, I got out of Facebook three years back and I feel my IQ has gone up, literally. I feel so much better. And I think I'm in a minority, I'm 24, but most of my peers are like obsessed with technology. I, I, sh I switch off my phone after eight o'clock because I like living the real world. I like actually conversing with people, I like traveling, I like adventure. So then how do you, how, is there a way you can convince the youngsters to kind of, you know, you know like live in a way that, you know, the way you guys used to live in the 80s. <laughs> in a sense, I'm fascinated by those decades because there was excitement. You know, when a movie came out, there was this excitement that, okay, I'm going to watch this movie. Now it's like, download it. YouTube where people are fighting. They're not, you know, artists in decline. We might never have an artist like Prince. I don't know how much Prince Rogers, Nelson, Purple Rain. We might never have an artist of that caliber. What do I have? Justin Bieber, Miley Cyrus. And what have I done? <laughs> it's just, so yeah, I just have a couple of comments. No question. Uh, I wanted to... Uh, um, yeah. Uh, I wanted to ask you about this, uh, the relationship between time and thinking that you are drawing. Uh, I was wondering what's the role of thought in that? Because to me it looks like um, you've uh, uh, been able to not really engage with the notion of thought. And uh, the emphasis seems to be more on the verb thinking, you know. And then uh, time becomes important in a very empiricist sense, in the sense that, for example, I can always say that uh, we don't really need time for thinking, you know, in terms of thought. And on the other hand, thought can also compress time. So, uh, for example, we also have it in our own life. Sometimes we say, oh, you know, uh, I'm not doing anything. I've become useless. You know, I want to take up a job or something. So my day is structured. And then I will do something, some real thinking, you know. So uh, there's no necessary connection between having all the time in the world and, then, and, and thinking. You know, sometimes it works the other way around. I reminded of this saying uh, in uh, certain rural areas, which says that, oh, you know, you have, uh, you're not doing anything, you're not thinking, you're not doing anything because you're lazy, you know, you have all the time, and if you have all the time, you are not going to think at all, right? So I think there's no um, uh, necessary connection there, really, you know, you can be in the most busiest kind of a life and have all the technological gadgets and still do deep thought. I remember this friend of mine who got this new gadget, you know, this Samsung, some latest Xperia or something. So there is a feature there of actually you can draw there, you know, on that uh, touch screen. And then the thing is such that he actually gets drawn into that drawing because once he makes a, a, a kind of, you know, moves his finger there or that uh, pencil thing, it, it throws another kind of figure there and that really draws you into it. So he gets into this intense moment of concentration. You know, so I was wondering, uh, how do you address that? Do we just have this easy critique of modern life and technology and say, come on, you know, we need the time and all that. So I think there's a kind of a, a nostalgia there, which I think lacks the critical edge. Would you like to respond to Okay. Uh, second round. Okay, um, thank you. Uh, well, the... Um, <coughs> First point, not really as a response, uh, but just to tell us. Uh, um, I don't really, you know, uh, advocate the idea of philosophy as another subject, which is about you know another thirty minutes in the curriculum. But rather, philosophy is a particular worldview, a particular way of approaching all subjects. So 
In fact, when we do different subjects and ideas, we look at how philosophy actually functions as a broad framework of how you approach different ideas and so on. But that's just as a uh, you know side comment about you know this real problem, a real genuine problem about curriculum. Uh, the question about South Pole, thank you. I'm just using an example uh, which is both in the scientific and philosophical literature. So when I came across it, I didn't know this. So I was just looking up. I was very curious. You know, why would they say this? Um, you'll see actually there are, you know, I'm sure you, you know this better, but if you go to the web, I mean, there are many sites which actually uh, discuss in great detail why, in what sense you mean that uh, South Pole has no time, in the sense that it doesn't have a time zone, like the other time zones, like GMT and so on. Now, uh, I was just using it to uh, illustrate this problem of the puzzles of time, you know. These are like, uh, you know, newspaper puzzles, just to show you something to enter into these problems of time, what spatial metaphors and so on. Uh, but you are very right, because uh, uh, I didn't, of course, talk about this question of this uh, rhythm, body rhythms, body time, and so on. Uh, but it, those lead us to very different kinds of questions about the nature of time. And you know, in fact, that itself, this reflection on the nature of time itself, uh, is an answer to a second part of the question that, you know, perhaps you don't need philosophy, but you just need thinking. Because, like, and that's why, you know, this accident, this coincidence, that for both education and, uh, and philosophy, the central point of concern is a question of thinking. So if you say, yeah, we don't need philosophy, but we need thinking, I'm going to have to ask, what gives me the vocabulary and the capacity to understand the nature of thinking, that's all. Either we take, as some people have done, that thinking is so generous, it's its origin, there's nothing behind it, nothing which can be described through other terms, then I can say, yes, I begin with thinking. But I'm also curious why philosophy for so many thousands of years in different traditions has come back to this problem of time. And it, it, lo lists, it looks at its job as clarifying the nature of time. And that's that interesting coincidence which I want to push at and explore. So I agree with you that what we need is thinking. But to know what thinking is, uh, I'm not even saying you know that we need uh, philosophy in some sense. I'm just saying there is something which philosophers have done which might be of use who want to understand that nature of thinking. Um, and the question about the Plato, of course, is very true. And the idea of the time as a container, which is a wonderful example, you know, both in the Platonic and other traditions, um, is, I think, a useful image to keep. But I'm also looking at this uh, challenge to philosophy in today's age. Given this anxiety about time that we face, what kind of possibilities of time can we recoup? And it's very difficult now to recoup some of these ideas of time because, you know, people respond to this uh, in very different ways. So I'm actually trying to see, uh, and, and therefore the binary between acting and thinking becomes more and more of a problem when you are constantly acting in some sense or the other with the uh, technologies. And, uh, uh, you know, to your friend behind you, uh, from the cavemen, we used to live in caves in the 80s. Um, you know, I think it's not about today's technology. I want to connect back to the other question. It's not really about today's technology. I mean, that's a very different kind of a question. Um, you know, very often if you ask a question what philosophers do, we may just uh, try and analyze or clarify certain situations. So we may reflect on today's technology in different ways, right? I mean, one understands the different levels at which technology operates. But having said that, there seems to be something about the question of anxiety and the way in which modern technology participates in creating that anxiety. That's all. Now, whether there are, as you know, I'm sure that there are a large number of psychologists who refer to these anxieties of modern technologies in different ways. There are many examples of one of my friends was telling me if he gets up in the you know in the night uh, to use the bathroom or something like that, he feels an immediate urge to check his email. And you're telling me, I don't know what to do. I just feel I have to check my email. As if at 2 o'clock somebody has sent him something. And he's doing it every night. And he realizes, he doesn't realize, you know, this night nothing special is going to happen. Don't check your email. Yes. Or this anxiety about phone calls and so on. There is, I mean, and uh, I, there is, a, again, I think very interesting examples about how this notion of anxiety is also about our constant lack of time. We, we seem to be responding to time as if it's going faster and faster and we have less and less control over it. But that, all I'm trying to point out is that is related to a kind of time, uh, perceptions of time that we have. You know, we cannot step out of it and say there is, we don't have any perception of time. We do have commonsensical uh, presuppositions about time which influences the way we understand all these events. 
Um, yeah, I think your question about thought and time is very interesting, and it uh, is a very different kind of a question. And again, uh, in terms of uh, cognitive science, it's a very inter important question. Now, I, do, I didn't talk in about in terms of thought, because you know thought has a very different set of philosophical problems associated with it. First, what kind of a thing is a thought? Where does it exist? What you know? How does how is thought created, etc.? Most people think uh, that thought is a product of a process of thinking. So you might have a thought, but there's a process of thinking which may have gone through it. You may be aware of the thinking, or you may not be aware of the thinking. So we are trying to even understand the process to understand the thought. It's very difficult to you know get away from this verb of thinking, and, and this is at least. You know, I would say a very standard response from philosophical literature. There are, of course, always exceptions, and I think the good thing about philosophy is that you know you can take any position you like, uh, as long as you can argue for it. So I, I think uh, the point and final point you made is uh, it's a very interesting point that, and I agree with you entirely on that. You may be completely immersed in the new technology, but you can do deep thought. You know, uh, that's absolutely no con contradiction about it at all. The contradiction, uh, I mean, the point which I was talking is in our day-to-day, -day, everydayness of technology. Our relationship to time may be very different from using those technologies. For example, if you're a very creative artist, you're using a technology, you may completely, or when I'm using a computer and I'm typing something, I'm completely zoned up. But you know what it actually shows? It shows something about the nature of time in a very profound way. It shows a particular quality of time which is not classified by the clock time or mathematical time. That's all. In fact, uh, a philosopher like Bergson would try and characterize this as the multiplicities of time. A very special quality of time, which is not related to this instant going on and on. And as you correctly say, when we are immersed in something, time does not pass. You can actually spend a lot of time being so focused and you wake up and say, oh, it's two hours since I started writing. And so how do we make sense of it? That's all. I'm not, you know, I don't think philosophy is offering us things, but how do we make sense of this? But can we add to that question yeah. for um, your reflection when you say about multiplicity of time? Yeah. Would you agree that a laborer who at the end of a very hard day uh, falls asleep, not because he doesn't want to think about uh, his day or his next day, but because uh, his life uh, just doesn't let him have any more energy. Yeah. And his time, therefore, is of a different kind from the time of uh, a middle class or a bourgeois person who has choices and uh, who in within those choices is exercising his choice by uh, using email at 2 o'clock uh, or participating in what you know this French uh, theorist of speed uh, Paul Virilio talks about the dronology as if of you know sending messages after messages <laughs> where they fall and what they do is none of the email senders uh, concern um, so between uh, in a society where the social distance between the poor and the rich is so vast, would you agree that uh, the idea of multiplicity of time will help us recognize uh, some deeper structural problems in the way uh, society is operating and in which uh, certain kinds of perceptions of time uh, come, you know, get privileged enough for us to be thinking about them, where there are other struggles that don't get the time of anyone, us or the parliament, <coughs> to get worried about. Right. Uh, I, I totally agree with that, and I'm, uh, thank you for bringing that uh, to the discussion. Because, you know, actually there's a very interesting experiment which I read long back, and I think there are other experiments around it, but I don't recollect what that earlier experiment was, which showed that thinking uh, uses 10 times more glucose than action. That is, when you think, you actually, the body system Biological system uses more glucose, so you need more energy, obviously, for the question of thinking itself. And that was a very you know, so that means uh, thinking is a real activity. <coughs> it's a real activity, yes. Right. And uh, I, and therefore, in this sense, you know, when you ask people about, unlike what I would like to say, yes. thinking is actually a real activity because it's an experienced activity, and we know, as I said, one example of knowing that I think is talking to myself. And too much of thinking, you know, obviously, as we keep often saying, it burns your brains up and so on. Uh, somebody was telling me about these chess players. He was actually talking about Vishwanathan Anand when he was very young. He said whenever he used to come back from the game, he would have a fever. I mean, you know, his body would be very hot and you're thinking, in some sense, 
probably burns up stuff. But this experiment was very interesting about the usage of energy. While but doesn't it bring back to science that ultimately we depend on mm -hmm. empirical proof to prove that there is thinking? <laughs> no, I, in this, I would say about this energy, I'm just adding a multiplicity of evidences. Yes. You know, uh, I think for the fact that, uh, you know, there are different ideas of time. You know, the Bergsonian multiplicities of time is, uh, I think, difficult for me to understand in its full richness. But um, the idea that there are qualities of time which are in principle very different. What does it suggest? And I think that's a very important question that you ask because does a society like its various other hegemonic concepts, constructs which it uses to govern and, and run a society, how does it use time to run a society? And that is something which, you know, has been well discussed in uh, early industrial age and uh, modern modernity and so on. And the question is, do we use this concept of time in order to govern in a particular way? And I think the colonial discourse shows us very nicely and clearly how you use the concept of time to govern. And I think this question you ask about people who don't have, and that's why this question about leisure and thinking becomes a very important issue. When somebody is so tired, you don't have time to think, uh, what is the context of thinking? I must just very quickly make a distinction between the cultural modes of understanding time like time is money, time is value, time is this, versus one kind of philosophical preoccupation about understanding the nature of time, what constitutes this idea of time. And sometimes, of course, philosophers become too, too esoteric and ask questions about things which sometimes are removed from this larger cultural politics of time. Uh, we have probably, we're, we're actually in the uh, territory which, is, which IAC doesn't like. <laughs> we should have dispersed five minutes ago. But uh, with the uh, uh, you know, benign consideration of the institution, I think we can have just one or two more questions, and then we must continue. Uh, I quickly, it's a, you know, I would like to introduce the concept of text here, yeah. because you know, uh, uh, while we are thinking about education and how time can be understood within the context of education, this is a quick comment that we can talk about it later. But I would like to introduce the con the idea of text here a text with which you can engage, you know, a text which can be placed, uh, you know, between that clock time thing and the deep time or whatever, you know, at that juncture if you place a text with which you can engage. Perhaps that is an area where we can, a composition of that kind of a text into which you can get it and then, you know, you can uh, kind of, you know, the, so this will also kind of relate to what he said, like it's not just a, a damning technology as such, but technology itself can bring in a certain moment uh, when you know if you place uh, the composition of text at, at that particular moment, it might be an entry point. So we have like so how I many questions? One question is about, uh, about quickly, please, because so otherwise uh, we will have to. So I think technological intervention hasn't, you know, we're talking about this technology and thinking. I think, you know, I believe that this comment about, I believe this uh, technological intervention in the human affairs has led to, we think exactly because of technology. I mean, so, you know, while my Maggie is ready, I think I post someone, you know, there are authors in, in Facebook, blogs, etc. While my Maggie is ready, I post something, I comment, I critique, I, let's say everyone, it, it's just given me an idea, it has given us an idea of everyone is an intellectual. Deconstruction of an idea of intellect. Who is intellectual? Oh, the thinker. What thinker? I can think as well. My posts are thinking. I'm getting you know, that kind of a thing. So I don't believe in that sense. You technological intervention is in this. Now I would just like to ask you again about actually taking the concept of time and relating it to our own needs. So we have a hierarchy of needs. We have the basic needs for food, security, and so on. And also there are other higher needs. <coughs> maybe artistic and other things. And I would argue that the technology itself is an enabler in that. Because really, if you go the right way, because a lot of things for the, <coughs> say if you think of a hierarchy of needs, things that are probably lower in priority as we develop, for that, the technology itself is an enabler. Because you have more time for thinking. Quick response, and then we concluding remarks. Maybe we can have two more. Yeah, unfortunately, we have to die to conclude. So I'm sorry about it, but any one. Any. So I was wondering, because you mentioned schools, and you were talking about the phenomenology of thinking and thinking 
Very quickly, uh, I want to respond to your question, and I, I, I would do in, just to state my point. I agree with this very important aspect of thinking, thinking with others, and so on. Um, that also goes back to these Dewey ideas of uh, you know uh, reflective thinking. Um, um, but you know the point is that sometimes thinking is seen as very personal, individual act, and there are very many good critiques of that, uh, which allows us to look at thinking in this particular form. It might be mediated by language, but it opens a different set of questions about thinking and communication. Um, I think uh, th there is still a bit of a confusion about what I said about technology and thinking. And I, as I was responding to the other point, I do not see, I do not want to suggest that technology inhibits thinking, or it has, it has no capacity to support you know, very deep thinking. Whether everybody is thinking or not is a different issue. And I, I do would like to see a democratic form of thinking um, I also would not like to see Twitter as the final embodiment of thinking of humankind. You know? But having said that, uh, I don't think, I'm not at all saying this about technology and thinking. Some of the greatest creative arts, uh, arts have come, very deep thought have come from very deep engagement with technology. I'm just talking about a symptom of the contemporary society where people are, I and mean, this is their instant age and their constant preoccupation with the cell phone, with Facebook, etc. And this question about no time to think is not formulated by me. I'm using it from a framework of many interesting educational projects. When they say there's no time to think, we are all under terrible pressure to do hundreds of things. University system, which is supposed to give us freedom to think, is it's not happening in the context of global academic capitalism. So I'm just responding to that point. And I'm trying to see how, uh, as an exercise, maybe you know, in a very esoteric sense, how philosophy can help us think through this in a particular way. That's all. So it's a very subversive act of bringing philosophy to the table rather than saying it's a talk on time to try and see how we could think about philosophy in this sense. Um, thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to call out of this uh, remarkable lecture uh, thoughts that uh, we can take home and reflect on. Um, in any case, I'm sure your discussion will proceed um, uh, even if this space is no more available. Um, I think the last question has actually uh, summarized the, one of the key educational implications already. Uh, in a way, uh, when you began, you already posed the problem that education faces in our times, the crisis that it's in. And that has to do with the fact that though we are all so well networked, we uh, feel isolated. Uh, how do we overcome, or how do we address this paradox, uh, this ongoing feeling of our life, which has these, this kind of dual face? Uh, and I call it uh, as a sign of a major uh, crisis in, our, in the context of teaching and education. Because actually teaching is all about relating. Uh, as the last uh, question tried to uh, suggest, uh, right from the earliest period of childhood to university life or wherever else uh, you educate people, it's all about relating. Where does time go when, you, uh, when a teacher teaches and a student learns? Uh, I often, as a teacher, uh, think about this. Where did my time go? Or of my life go? Or where does a teacher's time go? And the answer can only be given in the following words, which... Unfortunately, I can't really figure out in English. That's the only way one can think about it. This time has gone into the lives of the people with whom you related as students in your uh, act, in your uh, role as a teacher. And it's in this sense that I think technology, or at least the extremist view, which I call the techno-romantic view uh, of education today, 
which is so dependent on or which is mistaking technology uh, for a substitute of the teacher and the teacher's time and, and the teacher's relationship, I think uh, they've got it wrong somewhere. And that's where I worry about education even more than one did before. Uh, even as India becomes more literate, more educated, where schooling is now about to get universalized, one worries about it, whether we can rescue this central theme in education, that it's a relational activity. Um, it's, once you accept that, the number of things become easy. Uh, and especially the Maggie Noodles metaphor and the problems that it poses become uh, resolvable in the sense that education is not about answering questions. Uh, in fact, you know, in his critique of modern American education or modern world education, uh, Holt made a very interesting, simple point. He said, you know, learning is all about living with questions or delaying the answers. Uh, I often find uh, myself saying to my students, look, let's have a few nails around in our classroom where we can hang questions, which will keep reminding us of where we have been in the last few months, and we will keep coming back to these hanging questions. And each time we return to them, these questions will pose new questions or, or will help us to measure our own progress in terms of how much can we live with those questions. Now, living with questions becomes possible for the young precisely because they have somebody to, somebody living to live with. It's not just with a question that you live. You live with a person. And that's the teacher who gives you the confidence to live with queries, to live with curiosity to live with questions that nobody is going to quickly answer. In fact, the good teacher is the one who delays questions. So time in education really is the art of postponement, you can say, which is not something which in our decisive age our manager friends would like. In fact, it's precisely in the 80s, the period which evokes nostalgia in the minds of our younger friends, it was precisely in that period that the managers took over education by saying, you guys think too much. It's time to do something about it. And this is something which is their message, their motto, actually, uh, that India must do something about things rather than just think about things. And uh, that the nation you know, wastes time thinking. Well, to the galaxy of the uh, quotables that uh, this evening we have had the privilege of uh, uh, being a witness to, let me add one more. The man who inspired Gandhi, uh, lived for quite a while in a place where he had no relationships, uh, Walden, uh, his life in the wild, in the wilderness. And he came to this feeling in one of those moments of watching the stars and the moon go by, that you can't possibly waste time without injuring eternity. Uh, and I think it's a, it's a very pretty thought to carry in mind, that if you discuss if you think, if you have nothing to take home after a discussion, uh, the time was still well spent. It's like a railway journey which you spent looking through the window. And uh, there was a lot that happened in that process, even though at the end of the day, uh, perhaps it's just those SMSs which you sent, which will be seen as the tangible fruit of this. But the idea of education, I think, is uh, something that um, uh, this evening uh, does become sort of a palpable reality as we think about time, because education does need time. Children need time to grow up. They need time to relate to their parents and their teachers and friends. And uh, the managers are wrong to say that they need quality time. <laughs> That's not one of the categories in the multiplicity of times. The notion of quality times, time is precisely the notion of Maggie noodles, which claims to be quality food even though, whatever it is, those of you who consume it, or your children compel you to uh, bring for them, you know very well what it is. Thank you very much for this very stimulating <laughs> Thank you all for coming. Uh, thank you, uh, Sundar. Thank you, Krishna Kumar. It was fascinating. Uh, and on, on December 2nd, we have Vinod K. Jose from the caravan. He's talking about uh, media and responsibility. Please do not miss this lecture. And please leave your email IDs uh, so that you receive fascinating reminders, uh, newsletter, etc. So